Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dinkler. I happen to be attending a conference over the weekend, and Professor Dinkler uh, very kindly asked me if I wanted to um, uh, speak to you, and, and I accepted. I didn't know it was going to be such a cold night. <laughs> if it, on a cold night like this, I wouldn't even want to listen to me. <laughs> so I thank you for coming anyway. Uh, I want to, um, uh, this is an expansion of um, uh, the presidential address uh, that I gave two years ago now, uh, trying to see what, uh, how to develop a different type of biblical criticism in line with the times. And in, at this point uh, tonight, what I want to do is to look at the, uh, the context within which we find uh, ourselves by drawing on the work of uh, other individuals in their respective fields. Within the field of biblical studies, I have long been interested in matters of theory and method. How it is that critics do what they do, both by way of grounding and practice, as well as in matters of location and perspective, in where from they do what they do, both in terms of social, uh, social cultural context and ideological political agenda. Such interest has led me over the years to identify and analyze various grand models of interpretation, each bearing a complex, conflicted trajectory, as well as a broad spectrum of variations. These are uh, historical criticism, literary criticism, sociocultural criticism, ideological criticism, cultural studies criticism, and religious theological criticism. More recently, I have become keenly interested as well in the vision and mission of criticism, what it is that critics do or should do, and why it is that they do it or should do it. Such reflection would apply to the whole of the critical endeavor and hence would encompass all grand models of interpretation. At the same time, such reflection has led me to entertain a further grand model of interpretation, which for now I would like to call the global systemic. Here, the vision and mission of the critic would be approached from the point of view of the global system within which the critic lives and works and the responsibility of a critic as a critic in such a situation. Such a model would demand attention to an analysis of various dimensions having to do with the world system. To begin with, it becomes imperative to name and study the state of affairs of the world system with attention to the major crises impacting on the globe both individually and collectively. Second, it is also necessary to consider the range of theories having to do with world order, which would involve acquaintance with global studies. Third, it is further necessary to address the mission and vision of criticism in the light of such a state of affairs, with emphasis on a global perspective. Lastly, it becomes imperative as well to attend to the construction of a global systemic grand model of interpretation, conceptualized and formulated in highly sophisticated fashion. What I should like to do today is to offer some thoughts on the first of these constitutive dimensions, an analysis of the state of affairs of the world system, at least in part. Now, the times are critical. To say that the times are perceived as intensely critical would be an understatement. Such is certainly the case with respect to any area of society and culture, and such is also the case in terms of their overall conjunction as a world system. Indeed, our times are consistently portrayed as uniquely critical beyond the critical times of the past century severe as they were. Now, to bring the point across, I went online 
just about an hour ago, <laughs> and looked at three or four, four uh, different um, editorial p uh, pieces on this particular uh, question of the world system. The first one is, uh, is actually, it was an interview uh, of Noam Chomsky, published in a Mexican newspaper, an excellent newspaper, La Jornada. It's, it's online. It's, it's, uh, if you're looking for a good leftist paper, La Jornada is the one. This was 7 February 2016. Let me summarize what he's saying. Do you know Professor Chomsky at MIT? The United States is, uh, really consists of one political party, and that's business. There are two factions within that party, the Democrats and the Republicans, that have been totally transformed in the neoliberal age. The Republicans have been displaced to the right altogether by the neoconservatives, and the Democrats have become the former Republican program. As a result, there has been a tremendous denial of reality, such as, especially by the neoconservatives, climactic change, denial or skepticism, and even asking for an increase in the use of fossil fuels, leading to the worst problem of the human species. I'll come back to that very briefly. Denial of the border keeping out those who have, effect, who have been affected the most by U.S. destruction, the whole of Central America. The invasions that have been uh, taking place since, uh, since Iraq, in Iraq itself, hundreds of thousands dead, millions of refugees, and a conflict between the Sunni and the Shiite unleashed that was never there before, not to this extent. Also, the emergence of an Islamic state, and third, the destruction of Syria and its system of agriculture with millions of refugees. So, what are the consequences of, of all of this, especially climate change, he says. The rising of sea levels, which will mean the swallow, swallowing countries like Bangladesh altogether, affecting hundreds of millions of people who are going to go somewhere. The melting of the Himalayan glaciers, cutting off water supply for, the South, for South Asia. Hundreds of millions of people displaced. What will happen? And so he ends. This, we are facing the most important moment of human history. And humanity has time for a decision, whether to live or to die. And in effect, what he's saying is the United States is not answering the question. The Republicans are not, and the Democrats have become the former Republicans. So nobody is answering the question. Le uh, least of all in the uh, present uh, presidential elections. Now, you would say, of course, Mr. Chomsky is the far left, and, and you would be quite right. However, the, f the people that I'm going to mention now are by no means the far left. The first one is Thomas Friedman, who wrote an article, a piece, on January 20th, 2016, by the title, What If? online, New York Times. His argument was that there were shifts taking, pay, uh, taking place in the fundamental pillars of the global system, signifying the ending of multiple eras at once, and therefore making for a most uncertain future. First, I'll just mention two or three, with regard to China, the 30-plus year era of high growth is over, fueling a growth that in, in, in turn fueled global growth, imports, exports, purchases of commodities. Second, oil, 
Countries with economies propped up by oil prices will have to learn to grow by making goods and services. Nigeria, Venezuela, Iran. And so they will find themselves vastly underfunded with surging populations. Third, I'll just go on, the, United, the uh, European Union. Shutting bo uh, borders and building fences, which if, if it continues will mean the end of Europe as we have known it. The Middle East, uh, Friedman says, Iranian isolation is over precisely at the time that the Arab system collapses throughout and the two-state solution in Israel is over for good. There's no two-state solution, forget about it. So what happens, US? A two-party system radicalizing Far right touching on fascism, stupid fascism, Mr. Trump, and far left socialism, Bernie Sanders, both of which options he considers to have ended decades ago as real options. In the presidential election, the questions are not being asked precisely as the tectonic planes of the world move. What about growth? What about jobs? What about security? What about resilience? What if all of these things are coming together at once and nobody knows what to do? And, and uh, least of all is posing the question about what to do. Another um, moderate voice, Joshka Fisher former, I believe, foreign relations, Minister of Foreign Relations of Germany, writing for the Project Syndicate, 1st February 2016. Let us call 2016, he says, chaos ascendant. It is a year of prophetic doom, missing only comets across the sky. The international order of the 21st century, of the 20th century is disappearing and there is not a glimpse of what is to come. The challenges are clear, the response is not. Order, the next order, any order, comes out of a struggle and domination. New pillars, new institutions, new players. How will this order arise at this point? Where will it come from? We don't know. But the old order is collapsing. That means the old order imposed by the hegemony of the United States in the 20th century is collapsing militarily, financially, and in terms of soft power as well. There is the fraying of the, America, of the Pax Americana, both in the Korean Peninsula and in the Middle East. The US, he says, is no longer willing or able to play the role of policeman in the world. And at the same time, you have a dilution of centers of power in the globalized world. And so he ends with regard to Europe. Europe finds itself in an unavoidable crisis, if not conflict. Rising neo-nationalism is the clearest indication of this. And the suicide of Europe has become at this point not unthinkable. This is a former prime, uh, foreign relations minister of Germany. Lastly, Roger Cohen, New York Times. Europe's huddled masses, 4th February 2016. Europe is being questioned from everywhere. Within Europe and outside of Europe, and may, may lead to the unraveling of Europe by giving up the Euro and the Schengen Accords, the, the free flow of peoples across 22 countries in, uh, in Europe. Tremendous identity crisis brought about by a small minority of Muslims who will be 8% in 2030 committed to terror, leading to division and xenophobic, xenophobic 
uh, parties. Therefore, the present age for Mr. Cohen is an age, an age of unraveling. The post-war is over, the post-Cold War is over, and the U.S. is nowhere to be seen. And in a power vacuum, something is always going to happen. So, the geopolitical divides are the most marked, he observes, in a generation. For example, you have from Syria massive migration, this is how he concludes, massive migration to Europe, all of whom, he said, should be bearing on their chests the following, reap what you sow, feckless world. End of quote. What about Germany? It has accepted a million refugees. It has avoided catastrophe for now, but up to what point will Germany continue to do this? And if Germany no longer does it, Europe is further unravels. That's within the last two weeks. These are all extremely serious voices throughout the world. So, the times are indeed uh, critical. What are our times? Where does the contemporary global state of affairs begin? If the Cold War marked the course of an era, its end signifies the beginning of a new epoch. So the dialectical struggle unto death between East and West, the two superpowers and their corresponding blocks of nations came to an end with the collapse of the East in 1989-1991. We find ourselves, therefore, within a state of affairs best described for now as the era of the post-Cold War, although you have just heard Mr. Cohen say we are in the post-Post-Cold War. And I wonder, after reading this, I do wonder if 2015 will mark a dividing, uh, as, as 1989 did, a dividing time for a new uh, era. More and more, I believe, that, that the collapse of China, the collapse of Syria, and so forth. Now, at the beginning, at the beginning of the post-Cold War era, there was tremendous uh, optimism. Optimism, utopianism was, uh, was coming. The end of history had arrived. By the time 2014, 25 years later, arrived, that optimism had pretty much vanished. Why such a shift within the post-Cold War era? During the past quarter of a century, crisis has followed upon crisis, fueling an ever-widening and ever-deepening sense of disorder. Such disease has involved any number of interlinked developments across society and culture. Geopolitical multipolarity, political breakdown at the level of the nation state, global economic meltdown and inequality, radical ecological transformation, seismic population trends and reactions, explosion of violence at all level. One could go on. The result has been this pervasive sense of disorientation, powerlessness, uncertainty. And these recent uh, editorial pieces bring it across more than ever before. Such has been the consensus verdict across the ideological spectrum. And what I would like to do is to capture this sense of fragility and threat by way of three particular discourses and critiques. Global economics, climatological projections, and worldwide migration. Let me begin with climatological projections. I will call it the specter of the post-human. In 2009, the Bengali scholar Deepesh Chakrabarti, Lawrence A. Kimpton, Distinguished Service Professor of History, Salvation Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago, 
published an article in Critical Inquiry on the crisis of climate change and its significance for historical studies. The Climate of History, Four Thesis. Chakrabarti is a scholar of wide-ranging interests with a particular concern for matters of method and theory throughout. Modern salvation study, subaltern studies, post-colonial studies. With this study, he moves into the area of environmental history. As he reflects on the implications of global warming, not only for the history of humanity, but also for the field of historiography. Through the exposition of four theses, he argues, the crisis of climate change signifies a fundamental change in the climate of history, both in terms of the course of human history and the narrative of such history in historiography. Relying on consensus opinion among scientists, Chakrabarti accepts as a historian the emergence of a planetary, ecological, or environmental crisis as a result of modernity, especially the project of industrialization with its massive release of greenhouse, house, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere due to the consumption of fossil fuels and the practice of intensive animal farming. While the analysis of the crisis can be traced back to the late 1980s and early 1990s, it is only in the 2000s that such discussion gain, gains traction in the public arena, as the warnings regarding global warming and its effects become more pointed and urgent in the light of various developments already very much in evidence. Following this line of discussion, Chakrabarti goes on to situate this crisis within the broader framework of deep history the history of humans not only beyond the modernity of the last 400 years, but also the recorded history of the last 4,000 years. What is taking place is a change in geological epochs. 10,000 years ago, a marked rise in global warming brought about a shift from the Pleistocene or Ice Age to the Holocene Age making possible the development of agriculture and the rise of major civilizations. Today, a similar steep rise in global warming signals a similar shift from the Holocene age to the Anthropocene age. While the former transformation was caused by natural contingent changes, the latter ongoing transformation is generated by human-induced changes. Thus, humans emerge as geological agents for the first time. Consequently, humanity can now contemplate, beyond the planetary crisis underway, the possibility of its own end as a species on the planet. For Chakrabarti, as a historian, this crisis bears profound consequences for the practice and theory of historiography in two ways. To begin with, a change is in order with regard to the traditional separation of human and natural history. With this insistence that only the former, human history, constitutes the proper domain of historiography. In addition, a change is imperative as well with respect to post-colonial historiography, with its focus on global capitalism, the project of globalization, and the role of capital. On the one hand, the strict human natural division has collapsed. Originating in the 17th century, this binomial endured well into the 20th century, when it began to yield due to two discursive developments, the work of Fernand Braudel and the Annal School, given its view of the environment as an agent in human actions, and the rise of environmental history, given its approach to human beings as biological agents. In introducing the role of human beings as geological agents, the crisis shatters altogether the division. 
Human history becomes a pivotal factor in natural history, and natural history may prove the undoing of human history. On the other hand, the globalization climate bifurcation has given way. The analysis of globalization developed alongside that of climate change in the 1980s and 1990s. Yet while the former took hold immediately in the human and social sciences alike, the latter did not. In introducing the notion of human beings as geological agents, the crisis undoes any such separation. Globalization functions as a key factor in climate change, and climate change affects globalization by way of humans as a species. The collapse of the human natural binomial brings a different focus to historiography. From the Enlightenment to the present, freedom, a blanket category for diverse imaginations of human autonomy and sovereignty, has been the fundamental motif of historiography. At no point over the course of these 250 years has geological time or agency been addressed despite the fact that this was the time when human beings also began to turn toward fossil fuels. In other words, the banner of freedom has been grounded throughout in the consumption of fossil fuels. Now freedom and climate must be brought together, otherwise climate will overwhelm freedom. If the planetary crisis is to be addressed and a way to be found of it, the use of reason must be invoked on a global and collective scale. This is especially so as the crisis aggravates in coming decades as a result of human crisis, crises unleashed by the conjunction of sharp demographic explosion and severe economic inequality, leading to, quote, a planet of slums, end of quote. The undoing of globalization and climate introduces a different dimension as well. A tradition of historiography associated with the left has pursued the motif of freedom through a critique of a capitalist world and its project of globalization. The argument goes as follows. Globalization has led to the crisis of global warming. The crisis reflects a crisis of management and at the heart of capitalism. Climate change will only sharpen the profound inequities brought about by globalization. This type of critique, argues Chakrabarty, fails to take into consideration the fact that the crisis affects not just the excluded of globalization, but everyone, the human species as such. Consequently, a historiography focused on capital and its critique proves in inadequate for addressing the role and fate of human beings as geological agents. Globalization and climate must be brought together, otherwise climate may well overrun capitalism. What Chakrabarty has in mind in the wake of such deconstructions of established lines of historiography remains elusive. For, as he acknowledges, such historiography works at the limits of historical understanding. Such understanding always has human experience as a foundation, but there is no such experience of species on the part of human beings, only a concept. A number of glimpses can nevertheless be noted. The crisis itself has introduced the threat of finitude for all human beings and thus a sense of collectivity. It has shattered the human natural binomial by exposing the role of human beings as geolo geological agents and undone the globalization climate bifurcation. Second, the sense of human collectivity as a species is not experienced as such and does not do away with the diversity and particularities of human beings. Third, it demands a global approach to politics without the myth of a global identity. Finally, 
Such a global approach requires multidimensional analysis from academics who must surmount the limited scopes and optics of their particular fields of studies and pursue, quote, a conversation between disciplines and between recorded and deep histories of human beings, end of quote. Such a boundary historiography is described as, quote, a negative universal history. It is a call that I find compels biblical criticism. Second crisis, the outbreak of the post-national. The crisis of migration is brought vividly to life by the news media on a daily basis. Highlighted above all is the movement of migrants from the global south to the global north, understood along economic rather than geographical lines. This pattern of migration, intercontinental in nature, is at work across the entire globe. Flashpoints are clear. From Africa to Europe, the Mediterranean Sea. With the Italian island of Lampedusa in the Strait of Sicily and the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla in Morocco as key signifiers. One can now add the island of Lesbos as well. From Asia to Australia, the northern coast, with detention and relocation centers such as Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean and Manus Island in Papua New Guinea as the main signifiers. From Central America and Mexico to the United States, the border, with the fence straddling the borderlands as signifier. In 2007, a splendid volume on international migration appeared. Its author was Dr. Khalid Kosser, Deputy Director and Academic Dean at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. The volume is given a distinct political edge. Its aim is twofold. On the one hand, it seeks to move away from the alarmist tone of the media as well as the trite character of the discussion at all levels, imprecise use of concepts, tendential deployment of statistics, disregard for the complexity of migration. On the other hand, it seeks to develop a highly sophisticated discourse marked by sharp theorization and universal scope. A properly delineated and differentiated set of concepts awareness of the limitations inherent in the use of statistics, and attention to all aspects of migration as a global phenomenon. Coser distinguishes between internal and international migration and offers a typology of the latter. Voluntary or forced, where the latter means having to leave on account of conflict, persecution, or the environment, refugees, Second, political or economic, with the former standing for leaving for political conflict or persecution and the latter for economic reasons, refugees and labor migrants, respectively. And third, legal or illegal, with the latter signifying migrants' documents or fake documents, irregular migration. All these categories, he readily admits, are decidedly unstable and inseparable. The migration from global south to global north is one that is over overwhelmingly irregular in character, motivated by economic as well as political reasons and involving voluntary as well as forced circumstances. International migration, he goes on to argue, is always the result of major crises provoked by a variety of scenarios, such as the shock waves of global events, revolutions, wars, imperial rises and demises, the ways of structural change, economic expansion, nation building, political transformations, 
Behind such migration today, and in particular, the irregular migration from south to north, lie a number of factors closely interlinked, deriving from the project of globalization. First among these stand those having to do with economics. To begin with, there is the sharp disparity that exists in ever-growing fashion between the developed and developing world, which leaves the South in ever greater straits. Declining standards of human welfare, spiking pressures of population growth, worsening ravages of political instability. In addition, there's the crisis of jobs present throughout the developing world as a whole, which requires the availability of migrants uh, sorry, underpaid employment, forced labor, stressed labor, unemployment, underemployment. Lastly, there is a division of labor in place throughout the developed world, which requires the availability of migrants for a sector of the market, namely the performance of the jobs called 3D jobs. Dirty, dangerous, and difficult. In all, spite of the nuances and exceptions made, the overall portrayal of the global state of affairs is quite on the bleak side. The repercussions of international migration are always broad-ranging and far-reaching. They affect the migrants, the countries of origin, the countries of destination. Today, they are reaches greater having an impact on virtually everyone throughout the world. With regard to the south to north migration, the following figure prominently. Primary to my mind is the factor of human dignity. For migrants, the trek is fraught with tribulation from beginning to end. Very difficult, if not impossible, conditions in the countries of origin grave dangers throughout the journey, very difficult, if not impossible, conditions in the countries of destination, from discrimination through abuse and violence to slavery. In the countries of destination, a variety of developments are in evidence. First, the real and perceived social and cultural implications of having an ever larger number of migrants from the South in their midst. These range from fear of competition for scarce jobs to fear regarding the loss of national identity. Second, the association of migration from the South with the issue of national sovereignty and security given a global atmosphere of hyper-insecurity and hyper-securitization. This linkage may and does and will lead to a stark militarization of the border, requiring high investment in personnel and weapons, as well as a panoply of extra-legal measures and arrangements, leading to tacit subversion of democratic values and procedures. Third, the rise in extremist nationalist groups and parties with a message of rejection and exclusion toward migrants from the South, often transferred onto legal migrants as well. <coughs> Looking toward the future, the phenomenon of migration is seen as expanding and significantly so. In, effect, in fact, he points out, there is emerging consensus that the migration from the global south to the global north can only be managed, not controlled. It is not difficult to see why. As long as the causes behind irregular migration exist, and they not only do, but will grow more severe, the flow will continue and intensify. And what are these causes? the economic factor, the gulf between South and North. And in a separate study, he presents another uh, such uh, reason, the economic meltdown of 2008. 
presented as far more significant than economics. The process of climate change and its disruptive impact on populations around the globe. For the future, therefore, all the repercussions of irregular migration will multiply as a result. Needless to say, such a sophisticated discourse on migration has weighty consequences for the academic world in general. To begin with, it reflects the formation of a new field of studies, migration studies. In addition, it has clearly a bearing on any numbers of fields of study given the varieties, repercussions of migration. Further, Kozert himself ties it closely to two other fields of study arising as a result of consequences of international migration, diaspora studies and transnational studies. The former deals with ethnic minorities who function in the countries of destination while preserving close ties to the countries of origin. The latter is concerned with ethnic minorities who lead a life of in-betweenness, functioning in both the country of destination and the country of origin. Such questions affect all fields of study. I would argue it affects my field of study as well. Third crisis. the advent of the post-global. In 2007, a new interdisciplinary journal on globalization studies with a focus on the concept of the Global South was launched by Indiana University, the Global South. The introduction contained an article by its editor, the post-global South, Alfred Lopez, professor of English at Purdue University, and a scholar with interests in post-colonial Caribbean and globalization studies. It advances on the one hand the critical account of globalization as a process involving three stages, construction, deconstruction, alternatives. These stages are at once sequential and simultaneous, given the speed that marks the project of globalization. What emerges as a result is a vision of the global south as a post-global reality and signifier of subalternity across boundaries. The piece calls on the one hand for a broadly based analysis of this reality, the development of a post-global discourse that draws, up, draws upon the full spectrum of fields of studies in the academy. Globalization, Lopez argues, emerges in the 1980s and accelerates through the 1990s as the global master narrative. It is, in effect, the hegemonic discourse of the post-Cold War era. The narrative presents the process as yielding such growth as to lift the entire world in its wake. This is neoliberalism. From the very rich to the very poor. Such growth requires the development of an integrated world economy based on free trade and free markets and governed by the laws of exchange. Such growth would not only benefit those individuals directly engaged in the process, but also would solve all social ills and thus resolve social contradictions. Oh, Marx, come to an end. This were the years of Clinton, by the way, President Clinton. The reality behind the narrative, Lopez continues, proved quite different, leading to a counter-narrative that exposes the downside of the project. The narrative points to a series of financial crises that have called into question any dream of an integrated world economy ruled solely in terms of the market and capital. The narrative also foregrounds the differential consequences of neoliberal policies which have only served to heighten social life and accentuate social contradictions. Thus, while the interests of the elite have been protected and furthered, a series of setbacks for the working and middle classes have resulted. Lower wages 
and fewer benefits. An increase in unemployment alongside a decrease in job security. A reduction of social services for the working poor. As many economists now argue, it has been the poor, the disadvantaged, the marginalized, who have paid the price of the project, among whom minorities and immigrants figure by far. For Lopez, therefore, the global south of yesteryear, the south of colonial discourse and post-colonial studies, has become the post-global south of today. The South of subalterns throughout the world who are keenly aware that the project of globalization has failed utterly and that they embody the margins of, quote, the brave new liberal world of globalization, end of quote. This post-global South thus moves beyond the North-South divide of ye yesteryear insofar as such subalterns are to be found as immigrants and minorities, remember Khalid Koser, throughout the global cities of the geographical north as well, including, as I saw from my way, in my, on my way from the airport, New Haven itself. They have been displaced from the geographical south and find themselves disjointed in the geographical north, at once put to use and set at a distance. Despite a host discourse of, quote, multiculturalism, rights, and tolerance of social difference, end of quote. Immigrants become thereby both, quote, avatar and pariah, simultaneously a product of globalization and a scapegoat for its many failures, end of quote. From an academic scholarly point of view, therefore, the task is to explore the subjectivity and agency of subalterns. Those who live in the debris of global capitalism without access to its benefits through the development of a post-global discourse. For Lopez, globalization calls forth opposition as rapidly as it unfolds. The reason is clear. On the one hand, its wreckage is unquestionable. Quote, widespread poverty, displacement and diaspora, environmental degradation, human and civil rights abuses, war, hunger, disease, end of quote. Present in a post-global South that includes not only the geographical South, but also the metaphorical South present in the geographical North. On the other hand, the struggle for survival is equally undeniable. The emergence of subaltern cultures and economies by way of ethnic, religious, or national identity construction. A spectrum of transnational groups working out of the same logic of opposition. Post-global discourse is to take up, therefore, in inter- and multidisciplinary fashion, the condition of such groups. The who, the question of identity, local or global. The why, the logic of globalization. And the how, the cultures of opposition. Its aim in so doing is to search for a glimpse of the future, the potential for a post-global politics and economics of inclusion and enforcement. Let me draw this to a conclusion. I lost the main page. It is clear what all of these individuals are saying about their respective fields and also about their call for other fields to become involved in their fields and mount a multidisciplinary discourse to address these individual crises, which I would insist, and they all insist, these are not just individual crises. 
all of these crises are feeding one another and are creating a major crisis of the global system. The global system is collapsing as, as um, we have noted. Now, the result is an analytic description of the times and the crisis of the world system in postest fashion. Post global, as Lopez would have it, from the perspective of economics. Post human, as Chakrabarti describes it, in terms of climatological changes. And post national, as Koser characterizes it, from the perspective of world migration. That their verdict about fields and their call for fields to cooperate applies to religious studies in general and Christian studies in particular and biblical studies in the concrete, to me, should go without question. The question for biblical criticism is how to do so. And this is the problematic for an envisioned global systemic grand model of interpretation, which I cannot give you because I'm only at the first step. <laughs> if you remember liberation theology, there are three critical mediations that are necessary. And they are critical analysis of society and culture, critical analysis of scripture and tradition, critical analysis of praxis. What you have seen is an exercise in the critical analysis of society and culture in critical dialogue with a number of scholars in other fields that are dealing with the crises in question. And I'm thinking that all of these analyses and all of these crises should impact upon religious studies, Christian studies, and biblical studies. One way, this is all abstract, one way in which this point can be driven home, as always, is by way of literature. Let me suggest a, a work in every one of these dimensions. First, we did first climatological change, climate change. I would urge you to read The Collapse of Western Civilization, A View from the Future, published 2014, Columbia University Press. It was written by Naomi Oreskes, professor of the history of science, affiliated professor of earth and planetary sciences at Harvard University, and co-authored by Eric Conway, historian of science and technology associated with the California Institute of Technology. What they have done is to combine science fiction and history. The imagine it's someone in an imaginary future reconstructing the past. Which, what past? Our past. And so this future historian is writing in 2,393 in the Second People's Republic of China. at the tercentenary of the great collapse of the West in 2093. Soaring temperatures, rising sea levels, widespread drought leads to the disintegration of, West, of the West Antarctica ice sheet, bringing about mass migration throughout the world, and a reshuffling of the global order. And this historian, in 2393, asks, how could the children of the Enlightenment, the elites of industrial societies, fail to act despite the information that they had? Especially what during what they call the penumbral period, 1988, behind us, 2093, and the Great Collapse, 2073, 
2093. How could the children of the Enlightenment have ignored all the warnings? The historian says, well, on the one hand, it was rooted in the fixation of the West for free markets. And secondly, the scientists were strung by cultural practices that did not allow them to act, such as stringent standards for accepting claims of any sort. It's a brief book. Read it. They followed up with, uh, with a video, which I also recommend, called Merchants of Doubt, 2010, hyphen. How a handful of scientists obscure the truth on issues from tobacco to global warming. Read the other one first. Now, my migration. What to read? Well, two good things. One from 1973. Not very well known. It's a book, a novel, called Le Camp des Saints, The Camp of the Saints. It's an allusion to, remember Satan, released after a thousand years, joining all the nations of the earth, Gog and Magog, and marching against the camp of the saints and the beloved city. It is fiction disaster. Disaster fiction. In the future, in the 21st century, around 2000, the author was Jean Raspail. It all begins when Belgium, as an act of benevolence, decides to adopt 40,000 Indian children from the gutters of Calcutta. And they bring them to Brussels. They find that life in Belgium is nirvana. And the word spre spreads throughout India. And all of a sudden, hundreds of thousands demand to be adopted. And an armada of ancient ships forms, rounds Africa, and it begins to approach France. Hundreds of thousands, close to a million people in all ships are now right in front of the coast of Africa, of France. So what is France to do? What is Europe to do? Well, I won't tell you the end. But what does ensue is a race war. And the whites, this much I will tell you, whites are engulfed by the non-whites. And at the same time, the half-nuts of the world begin a peaceful takeover of cities everywhere, moving from the slums to London, New York, Los Angeles, Manila, wherever. Buckingham Palace, so forth. It's a good novel. Last year, two years ago, 2014, as a follow-up, read that one first. Now, read read. 2014, Soumission, Submission, by Jean Houellebecq. This is fiction history, and the future is 2022. In 2022, elections are held in France. There are three parties. The National Front, Marine Le Pen, sounds familiar? the Socialists, and the Islamic Party. The Islamic Party in, ally in alliance with the Socialists win the election and take over the government, democratically. Islamic law in, in this, um, uh, in, in this um, discussion about the alliance, Islamic law is adopted through our friends. Polygamy is allowed. Women must wear veils throughout Europe. 
au Dieu la France. And the universities are run now by Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi, who pour enormous funds of money into La Sorbonne and other universities. The story is told by a decadent intellectual, François, a professor of literature at the University of Paris, specializes in 19th century uh, French literature. Truly decadent. At the end, he first loses his job, and then the offer comes, if you convert, he's not, he's not Christian, he's not anything. If you convert to Islam, we will pay you five times what we were paying you before, and you can preserve your post, and you can have several women, several wives. Submission. Submission. He does. What do both have in common? The sense of um, what's happening in our world. 1975, 2014. Now, lastly, inequality. Here, I'm at a quandary. I haven't found anything really, that capture the moment. And then I ran into an article by uh, Anna Clark at, on the Pacific Standard, you can look it up, April 1st, 2014, called The Heirs of Steinbeck. And Anna Clark tells, tells us, well, 75 years have elapsed since the graves of wrath. A fiction a work of fiction that examined macro and microeconomics of poverty, which is all too rare today. The story of Steinbeck is simply not our story. What was the context of Steinbeck? Unemployment around 17% in the country. Farms were swallowed in dust storms caused by cotton crops that kill the roots that held the land down, because rotation farming was not allowed. Tenant families told that a tractor can take the place of 12 to 14 families, and therefore families must, li must leave. Keep, keep listening to the debate on automation and robotics that is going on right now. Tom Joad and his family you know the story, go to California. On the way, the family has several deaths. A couple of people, a couple of members of the family leave the group, and they meet people going back from California to Oklahoma. And they're saying, what? Don't waste your time. They are broke, they are bittered, bitter, they are betrayed. This was a radical, she says, a radical and provoking story that invited a great deal of backlash. The book was banned, it was burned, and there were all kinds of discussions on, on the work. Now, in contemporary literature, in the context of a brutal recession, where, she asks, are Steinbeck's heirs? Those who deal with the plight of the poor. For the most part, they are to be found in short fiction. Two names, you will, you may, one name you will probably recognize, Junot Diaz. This is how you lose her. And the other one is Bonnie Jo Campbell, American salvage. What globalization has done in Michigan. But she says, these are not an ultimatum for America, as Steinbeck was. There isn't the urgency in these stories, nor the delineation of the process of de devastation. There is how poverty affects individuals and how individuals survive, but not how the process itself takes place, as there was in The Graves of Wrath. The characters actually move in the opposite direction into self-recrimination. But, she says, where is the story that 
what happened did not have to be this way. Where is the Steinbeck of the present? I have been looking for something like that. And then I found this article by a critic that explained the why. I couldn't find a novel that would relate globalization and the poverty that, uh, that comes about as a result with the force that the Graves of Wrath did in 1939. A book, by the way, that affected Dorothy Day enormously. That's in 1939 is when the Catholic worker movement begins. Now, to end. What I have done here is but a glimpse at the first of various dimensions pertaining to such an enterprise. The critic would need to look at how these crises come together as a crisis of the world system as a whole. Establish critical conversations with theories of world order, contemplate its own trajectory with regard to mission and vision, and devise ways of implementing such a model. The challenge is enormous. The breadth and the depth of the knowledge required, the radical need for collaboration and discussion among fields of study, the critical need for cooperation among critics from around the world. To be sure, we could go on doing what we have done and continue to do so well. But I would not want it to be said of me and of us that we, or at least some of us, fail to respond in some way, fail to insert the factor of scripture and interpretation, for all of these crises are in scripture, of religion and theology into the equation. For such a factor is there at all levels and at all times. And that factor I would submit to you, especially you young people. Mine is an aging body and a not so aging mind. I'm on my way out, but you are surging. I would submit that it compels all of us, but especially you, to respond. Thank you very much. <laughs>